So uh, you have uh, the New Hope Notes. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up our Philippians uh, series this morning. Uh, looking forward to a, a very mini two-week series coming up next Sunday and the Sunday after that, then launching into our 40 Days in the Word uh, series. And this morning, I want to think about this whole idea of just pr- kind of praying nonstop grace flow. Uh, the two verses that I want us to think about this morning is the second verse in Philippians chapter 1, and then the last verse from Philippians chapter 4. Paul begins his letter saying, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He ends his letter saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. When you read Paul's letters, if you pay attention, most of the time when he begins his letters, he's always starting with this idea of grace, this grace, that this grace would come to you. He always ends his letter with this, and that grace would be with you. And as you read all the things in between his opening words and his ending words and almost all of his epistles... It's like almost that there is a grace sandwich. He begins with grace, he ends with grace, and everything in between is about grace. The wonder of this thing called grace. And so we're uh, titled this message, Praying Nonstop Grace Flow. We've uh, been looking at the timeline of the Apostle Paul in this letter of the Philippians over this summer. We believe that in Acts chapter 9, uh, we, hear, uh, we hear the story of Paul's conversion. We hear kind of his pre-conversion story of what he was doing, how he was persecuting men and women who were following the way, who were following uh, Jesus. And then as he is traveling to another city, uh, leaving Jerusalem because they've kind of figured out most of his tactics. They're in Jerusalem and so it's harder for him to find people. He's going to go to a, a Damascus, an ancient city, and try to arrest people there and persecute them for following this Jesus. And we read in Acts chapter 9 that he's converted. Uh, Jesus appears to him, kind of strikes him blind for a, a few days, speaks to him. And his life is going to do a 360, and that's what we read through um, a good portion of the rest of Acts, and then when he starts writing his epistles. We have been saying, uh, the, the Bible scholars tell us, that that happened in about 36 AD, a few years after the time of Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, if we believe that happened around 33 AD. So a few years later, and the church is beginning, the church is starting to expand, the church is doing what Jesus said it would do. It's going go to it's gonna start in Jerusalem, it's going to go out of the borders of Jerusalem, it's going to continue on, and we read that through the, the book of Acts. So Paul gets converted in 36 AD. We know from Acts chapter 16 that it's about 13 years later that he ends up being in this city far away from Jerusalem known as Philippi, in a historical place. Um, uh, there, there were men and women and children that lived there. It was a Roman colony. You can go there. There's ruins. There's um, uh, excavation and archaeology that has been st- studied there. Uh, all kinds of things. It was there um, established long before the Apostle Paul would visit it. But uh, again, about 49 AD, so 13 years after his conversion, he comes to Philippi. And we read in Acts chapter 16 some of the events that happened there. And uh, we, we remember this person called Lydia, who was a seller of purple. Uh, she hears the word of God and is converted. And as a wealthy woman, she invites Paul and his team to stay in her house where she will provide lodging, where she will provide probably the food. She'll provide just kind of care for this apostolic team, this gospel spreading team. Um, We meet also in Acts chapter 16, uh, almost an opposite uh, uh, lady, uh, this slave girl, not, doesn't even give, given a name. She's being exploited. She's being um, abused by a couple of handlers. She kind of has a, a manic personality. She's able to kind of tell fortunes. If you, um, and then uh, she's yelling about the Apostle Paul, how he is a man of God and people should listen to him. Again, not in a nice church way, like if someone would stand up all of a sudden and say, Pastor Jeff! You are a man of God. That would kind of freak everybody out. It freaked me out. And she, every once in a while, she would just break out and do that. And Paul finally just said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And her life was converted. The two men that were making money from her, when they realized that 
their ability to keep exploiting her was gone. They gathered a number of people from the city, said these people are causing trouble, they're disturbing the peace. And kind of a riot breaks out and Paul and Silas uh, ends up in jail after they are pretty much um, pummeled. And then we read the story in Acts chapter 16 of this jailer that ends up getting converted. Um, again, you can read all of that in Acts chapter 16. I won't take the time to go over that again. Um, but I want us to just to think about, in Acts chapter 9, as Paul's converted, there's grace happening. In Acts chapter 16, with all these stories I've just talked about, there's grace happening, even as they're getting uh, kind of pummeled in it. And then we said that Paul writes uh, the book of Philippians 11 years later. Uh, the scholars tell us, like about in 60 AD. But as you read through the Philippians, this, this letter that he, he writes to this, this congregation that's just dear to him, you just feel the grace flowing. Then we, we've been uh, teaching that in 68 AD, that's when the scholars tell us that Paul is executed. He, he is um, put to, to death, but we've always uh, put it in this, uh, the parentheses that that's gain. Grace happens there. Even as he's executed, grace happens in a way that he'd been imagining about, and now he doesn't have to imagine about it anymore. He's there in the presence of Jesus in grace happens. So again, there's just this idea, there's just nonstop grace flow. And in the book of Philippians, as it opens up, we've been concentrating on this thing called joy. You know, we've entitled the whole series, 10 for Joy, that you could read from Philippians 1 through to Philippians 4, just those four chapters in 10 minutes. And we encourage you to maybe have a practice this summer of reading through Philippians for 10 minutes. Sometimes not reading from Philippians 1 through Philippians 4, but every once in a while just taking maybe 10 minutes with a verse, 10 minutes with a word, 10 minutes with a paragraph, 10 minutes with a chapter, sometimes 10 minutes with uh, all four uh, chapters. But I want us to, as we uh, end this, this series, as we think about this joy, sometimes it's a weak word. I want us to think that there's a strong joy that Paul is making known to us through what he writes to the Philippians. And also this uh, um, uh, joy and affection as we're going to read here in these, some of these opening verses, uh, verses 3 to 11 of chapter 1. But again, affection is oftentimes another weak word, you know, especially for us men. Uh, affection, soft, cuddly little word. I want us to think of affection as just a mighty deep affection. That for all the years that Paul has been removed from when he was there in Philippians and what he experienced when he was there in Philippians and where he is writing from as he writes Philippians. There is a, there, there, there's just a strong joy and a mighty deep affection that he has in his heart. And there is a strong joy and a mighty deep affection that he has come to realize Jesus has for him. And there is a strong joy and a mighty deep affection that we can come to know that Jesus has for us. So when Paul writes this, he's not writing it out of the goodness of his heart, the goodness of his character. He realizes over the years that he's, he, as he continues to serve Jesus, things flow out of him that aren't there by nature. And it always kind of comes back to Jesus. So here's what we, he writes. But he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So he's talking about Jesus. He's beginning that work. He's going to complete that work. It's in the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. There's grace, that grace, that grace. Both in my imprisonment. Again, he's writing from prison. Again, if there was someone in our day riding from prison, oftentimes we would, uh, I don't see how Jesus can be with someone that's in prison. They had the same thoughts back then. But Paul is going to write that even as he's in prison, grace is happening. So he says, uh, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, that this gospel keeps going on. For God is my witness, how I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. 
not just an affection that he's somehow drummed up from himself, but he realized that Jesus has this affection for him, this mighty deep affection. And now he has this mighty deep affection for these people in Philippi as he's writing. And he wants us to know about this and maybe experience it ourselves. And then he says, and it is my prayer that, you, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. He's always refer, referencing back to Christ, back to Christ. There's not a verse that goes by that is really not Jesus is in that verse. Jesus is, is mentioned in that verse. The, the, the wonders of Jesus is in that verse, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. That's just the opening words. And so he has this, and he's going to kind of come back to that in the first couple of verses of chapter 2, but we'll get to that in a moment. So this strong joy and mighty deep affection, this can happen in you. This can happen in you. Imagine if you started realizing that Jesus, when he looks at you, there's a joy that's in you. That he has a mighty deep affection for you. That's why for some of you, he's been pursuing you for years. And some of you know that when somehow a switch flipped in you and you stopped running away from Jesus and somehow you started getting drawn into Jesus, like for some of you, um, five years ago, what we experienced in the three opening songs, you would have said, ugh, man. Yeah. But for some of you now, it's like, oh. there was some joy and some affection that you experienced in those opening songs. That joy, that deep joy, that, that, that the strong joy, that, 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 that this mighty deep affection it's not wimpy. It's not soft and it's not cuddly. The joy and the affection that Jesus has for you, the joy and the affection that Jesus wants you to know that he has for you, you can know that. You can know that. Imagine living with the wonder of that. I can't uh, end this series without uh, mentioning once again Philippians 1.21, uh, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Again, when we taught about this a number of weeks ago, probably back in uh, June, I believe it was, um, we said, again, just notice we kept this, this timeline in, in front of you that when Paul writes this, that he is writing it 24 years after his conversion. We've, we've talked about how there has been this process that even after his conversion, he probably wouldn't have been able to say these words right away. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But now after these 24 years of, uh, of serving and suffering for this grace that continues to just get a hold of him, more than him holding on to it, this grace has gotten a hold of him. And so as he continues to, to live, as he continues to serve, as he, that, as he is just, he's intense. I mean, the Apostle Paul, I've always admired him for just this intensity because I don't think I have that intensity like he, he does. I, if I had to do, go through some of the suffering that he had to go through, gosh, but Jesus has just wired him up differently from me, and I'm kind of thankful for that. Uh, but he has this intensity, this intensity, this intensity, but he keeps growing and growing and growing. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he's been at death's door over and over again, as we read in some of his other writings. He's, he's, he's been, he didn't know whether he's going to make it through an imprisonment. He didn't know if he's going to be able to survive a, a, a whipping. He didn't know if he's going to be able to survive a, a stoning. He didn't know if he's going to be able to survive a shipwreck. He didn't know if he's going to be able to, um, to survive a, a poisonous snake bite. And so he's been thinking about death, and he knows... He knows, like all of us knows, the death rate always keeps hovering around 100%. Always. And so he doesn't think as death as something morbid. 
For to me to live is Christ, and as long as I have breath, Christ. As long as I have breath, Christ. As long as I have breath, the, the grace of Christ. As long as I have breath, but someday, when I take that last breath, the gain that's going to be there. How true is this verse for you? Again, when we were considering this verse a number of weeks ago, and as maybe you've thought about it and read it over the last number of weeks and the number of months of June, July, and August, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Again, that's a question I've been asking myself. How true is this verse for me? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the question is, what if this verse starts to lean in on us just more and more and more? Because this verse is true. For to me to live is Christ. And Paul lived for Christ. And when he died, it was gain. That can be true for us too. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How would that change us? How would that start to revolutionize some of our thinking, some of our processing, some of how we start looking at what happens in our culture, some of what happens when it's Democrats and it's Republicans, and some of it when it happens that there's this sports um, frenzy that goes out in our society, that there's fantasy, base fantasy, football fantasy. Then, and how would that start to, for to me to live as Christ, and one day, to die is going to be gain. What if this verse starts leaning in on us more and more? For to me to live is Christ. Now, um, I'll leave that there and go uh, pretty quickly through Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. Again, tying back to what those opening verses in chapter 1. Here's what Paul writes as he's opening up kind of some new thoughts in Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Just bringing them back to more of this, this grace. And he goes on in verse three, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Then this verse, I, I italicized it and boldened it on our notes. Uh, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This verse has been God haunting me. Look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of of others. And Paul writes this from reflecting on Jesus. Jesus does not look to his own interests as we're going to read in these following verses. If Jesus was looking to his own interests, he would have never left heaven. He would have never come down and smelled the smells that he had to smell and fixed the broken hearts that he ended up healing to touch people, to speak to sometimes people who thought they were so religious, but they were so cold to God and so judgmental and so damning. But yet we see Jesus thinking not only of his own interests, but to the interests of people like us. So he would come and touch the man that was ready for his soul to be touched. He would come and heal a woman who had been broken not just once, but had spent a life of being broken. And he would breathe into her hope that she didn't think was possible. And he would gather the children whose lives were going to have all kinds of tough things and struggles. And, but again, he would just smile at them and say, for the kingdom of God belongs to little children like you. Put all of his interests aside. So I keep asking myself, Jeff, are you putting your interests aside? Are you thinking about the interests of others? And how will you serve them? For all of us, 
it's hard for us to put our interests aside because we watch everybody else not put their interests aside, but to pursue their own interests. Doesn't matter what other people think of them. Doesn't matter what the church tells you. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Here's what I see all kinds of other people doing. I'm going to do the same thing. Again, this verse has been leaning in on me heavily. And I'm praying that it's going to continue to lean in on me heavenly, let, heavily. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Because that's the motto of Jesus. Paul goes on and writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, the form of a slave, and we've talked about that over the last number of weeks and months, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself to be becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we have said that only slaves could be crucified. Non-citizens of Rome could be crucified. If you were a citizen of Rome, you could not be crucified. Jesus made himself a slave and was crucified. Paul, as we said, because he was a Roman citizen, as he makes known, he was executed. And again, sometimes we, you know, if you die, you die, but he would not be crucified when he was ex- his head would be cut off, which, again, pretty gruesome. But obviously, for them, it would be a much more humane kind of way of putting him to death because on crucifixion you suffered a lot and uh, anyway um, and being found uh, he humbled himself even death on a cross and then this turnaround this amazing turnaround these verses that again continues to explode in heaven and continue to, to explode out of hearts that are moved by who this Jesus is and how he serves us. That he didn't look to his own interests, but he looked to our interests. And then we read, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. Would you say those three words with me this morning? Jesus is Lord. And when you said Jesus is Lord, when Roman citizens and those that were under Roman rule were saying Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, and Paul comes along and says Jesus is Lord, things are going to happen. But Jesus will prove that he is Lord because Caesar has been dead for how many years? And when we think about Caesar, we talk about Caesar living in the year of our Lord, 48 AD or 50 AD. We mark Caesar by Jesus. And if you mark Caesar by Jesus, who is Lord? Most of us don't think a lot about Caesar, the Caesar that they were saying is Lord back then. But we think a lot about Jesus being Lord. I just finished a book that was released when we were at the Leadership Summit. Uh, John Ortberg, who is this man, we're going to be doing some things with this book probably around Christmas time and into 2013. Uh, this is a free copy of this book. Um, and uh, the first person that comes up to me after uh, the worship celebration this morning gets this book. Please, no stampeding. Um, well, this uh, book has just absolutely um, been staggering my mind. One of our messages from the Philippians series was based on uh, some of the things that, uh, of this uh, book. And again, over and over in this book, just from time after time after time, here's, here's how Jesus influenced science. Here's how Jesus influenced politics. Here's how Jesus influenced the uh, women. Here's how Jesus influences, uh, here's how Jesus influenced education. Here's how Jesus influenced or- orphanages and hospitals. Uh, again, there's just the, the wonder, the, the magnificence of this man, the, un- the byline of the, the subtitle, the unpredictable impact of the end inescapable Jesus. And again, just an awesome, awesome book. And I would encourage you, if you don't get this one free copy, that you go to a Christian bookstore or put it on your uh, uh, Kindle app or your smartphone app. And, uh, but boy, oh boy. All right, um, we're going to bring this to a close. One of the messages just a few weeks ago when we were looking at Paul writing um, in Philippians chapter 4 
uh, about a couple of uh, ladies that ended up having kind of a, a difficult, you know, it says, I entreat Yudia and I entreat Synecdoche uh, to agree in the Lord. Um, I, I ask you, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together. And then he mentions uh, an, another name. And so they're in church. They are both believers in Jesus, but they've kind of crossed hairs with one another. But Paul writes that somehow, how can we help these two ladies come back together, keep following Jesus? Then we use this analogy, this metaphor of Jesus being like a shock absorber. And again, our sin hits him, and it hits him with quite a bit of force, and it compresses him, but yet Jesus doesn't just hit us back. That's pretty much how we oftentimes live our lives. Someone hits us, causes us pain, we hit them back. But Paul, as he has thought about Jesus, as he's heard about Jesus, as he's meditated about Jesus, as he's heard the stories from the apostles, as he's heard the stories from other eyewitnesses over the years, Paul realizes that Jesus somehow was this great sin absorber. And he would always slowly release grace back to people like us. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. He's been doing it for 4,000 years because Jesus, when he comes on the scene, doesn't come out of the, on, on the scene from just nothing. He comes on the scene following his father. And in Exodus 34, 6, we hear these words as Moses is receiving the second set of the Ten Commandments as, the, as God is coming down to appear to him again. Again, Moses had broken that first set because of the Israelites sitting with the golden calf. He goes back up into the mountain. He asks God to show him his glory. God is going to show him his glory. And he says these words. God speaks these words about himself. He says, I am the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of the New Testament. That's the God of 2012, September 2nd, this Labor Day weekend. So we're not watching Jesus do new things. We're watching Jesus do what the Father has always done. He takes the hits and absorbs our sins and releases grace back to us. How are you doing as a follower of Jesus? How are you doing as a follower of Jesus with your spouse? Again, we know how to hit each other, don't we? And we know how to respond with a hit. How are we doing becoming a sin absorber from our spouse and releasing grace? How are we doing as uh, moms and dads, moms and dads of small children, moms and dads of teenagers, woo, moms and dads of adult children? How, how are we doing with uh, people at work? How are we doing with our boss? Or if we're a boss, how are we doing with our employees? Again, we live in a world that just, man, I just, ugh, just hit and they hit and we hit back. And again, you know, I was watching some college football yesterday. Man, you know, just, they hit, he hit. And we just, we live surrounded by. But if we're to be followers of Jesus, how are you doing? in becoming a sin absorber and a grace releaser. Not in your name, but in Jesus' name. So Paul begins, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. And he ends, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace. We have experienced a summer of grace. I believe we're going to experience a fall of grace in so many ways. 
I'm going to pray in a moment. Um, I'm going to, when I come back up at the end, I'm going to invite you to go through a, a prayer rock throughout our building, and we'll give you more instructions on that at the end. I won't tell you now because you'll forget in the next 10, 15 minutes. So I'll come back at the end and just kind of invite you. And again, you don't have to do this if you're not comfortable with it. But uh, for those of us who are here and are comfortable with just kind of maybe walking around and praying, we'll give you the instructions and what that's uh, about in a moment. So why don't we stand and pray, please. Jesus, for the wonder of the grace of this summer that you have released here at New Hope and the grace that you're going to continue to release. Uh, Again, we know that as we have experienced grace this summer that it doesn't end uh, with the turn of the calendar, but that it continues to build, that just kind of layer upon layer upon layer. As Paul would begin his letters, as Paul was in his letters, as all the way through his his letters, uh, just you, Jesus, just you, Father, you, Holy Spirit, just over and over again, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and how we can experience you, how we can follow you, how you can change our lives, how you can give us a hope, how we can move towards that idea of for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Jesus, do that kind of work in each of us as, uh, as only you can do, whether we're starting, uh, whether we're just beginning to grow, whether we feel that we're pretty close to you, we've been following you, or whether we're just somehow, we've become centered in you. And not from our doing, but from you leaning into us, lean into us more and more. Through this week, through this month of September, as we get into uh, the, 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 the fall ministry season, Jesus, 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 we pray for your goodness to be upon us. Your goodness, Jesus. Your grace. And so, Jesus, it is with uh, more grace that we pray, the prayer that is filled and always flowing with nonstop grace. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. Let's join together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.